because of the fact that Abu Talib also loved him. So Abu Talib loved his son Aqil, and because of that, the Prophet says he also loves Aqil. And he says, and this is the beauty of it, he says in the rest of the tradition, one salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, please. The second part of the tradition says that the Prophet says that I love Aqil because of the fact that his son, Muslim, will be killed out of the love of your son, Hussein. And through this, the Prophet says, the eyes of the believers will be filled with tears, and the angels in close proximity to Allah will pray over him. And then the hadith says that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, began to cry, and he cried so profusely that the tears fell onto his chest, and his blessed chest and his clothing became drenched in his tears. And the Prophet says that indeed I will complain to Allah on the Day of Judgment about what happened to my family after my passing away. So when we mark the martyrdom of Muslim ibn Aqil, he's not just an average person, he's not just an average companion of the Prophet or Amir al-Mu'mineen. He wasn't just you know, the right-hand man of Sayyid al-Shuhada. But actually he had a much nobler status such that the Prophet even foretold of his martyrdom years before the event of Karbala even happened. And that should be as no surprise to any of us because the Messenger of Allah foretold about Karbala many, many years before the event happened. And therefore I just wanted to mention that tonight in, in, in brief before I go to my main topic just to show that the love that we have for Muslim Ibn Aqil isn't a sentimental love, but rather it is a love rooted in the fact that the Messenger of Allah himself had a deep love and respect for Aqil and also for the family of Aqil. Salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillahi Alladhi Hadana Lihada, Wa Ma Kunna Li Nahtadiya Lawla An Hadana Allah. Thumma Salatu Wa Salam Ala Ashraf Al Anbiya Wa Sayyid Al Mursaleen Wa Shafi Al Mudhnibeen Sayyidana Wa Nabiyana Abil Qasim Muhammad. Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Muhammad. Wa Salatu Wa Salam Ala Ahli Baytih Al Tayyabeen Al Tahirin Al Ma'asumeen Al Madhulumeen Al Muntajabeen. Siyama Maulana wa Sayyidi Sahib al-Asi wa Zaman, Ruhi wa Arwahu al-Alamin alahu al-Fida. Wa ajal Allah Ta'ala farajuhu sharif wa lanatu da'imatu ala adaihim al-munkari fadailihim mila al-an ila qiyami yawmi deen. Amma ba'd rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri. Wa halu luqdatan mi lisani yafqahu kawli. Salu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This evening is also the, in addition to the regular Thursday night gathering that we have as a community, it's also the night of Eid. Today was the day of Arafat, the day where the Hajjaj were, had left Mecca towards the plains of Arafat. And obviously after they had finished the acts of worship in Arafat, they would have made their way to Mash'ar al-Haram, as the Quran refers to it as. They would have picked up the pebbles, they would have waited in Mash'ar, and it's interesting, although I don't want, don't want to go in much time on this and spend much time, but it's interesting that in Mash'ar al-Haram, for those who have been for Hajj, you'll know that there's no act of worship which is specific for that particular area. Meaning it's not recommended to read Quran, it's not recommended to do any du'as or supplications. You're told just to sit in that land and wait until the time of Fajr. You pray and then you make your way back towards the Jamarat. So the Hujaj, today on the day of Arafat, they would have followed that ritual following the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and the noble family and following the tradition laid down by Prophet Abraham and those who came before him. And tomorrow will be the day of Eid, the day of blessings, the day of the return back to Allah. For the Hujaj is obviously an entirely different atmosphere and a mood and, and, and a focus that they're in. But also for us, we should also be in a form of not only festivity because the day of celebration, but also tomorrow will be a day of introspection and, and reflecting upon what the Hajj means for those who are in the pilgrimage, but also those of us who are not blessed this year to go to the Hajj. And inshallah, tomorrow in my Eid sermon, I'll reflect upon one of the aspects of the Hajj. Tonight though, being again the night of Eid and also the Thursday night, I wanted to 
look at a topic which is, I think, relevant to our day and age. Uh, today, it's been there for the last 1,400 years within the Muslim community. But obviously, with the last, uh, the events over the last maybe five to seven to 12 years within the world, we see that there is an even greater urgency to look and reflect upon the topic of social activism within Islam. That how do we as believers in the 21st century, in this new era, how do we respond to the challenges of our faith being uh, insulted in the media? How do we respond to attacks and accusations against the noble messenger? You know, we had cartoons and caricatures which were drawn about five years ago, published in many newspapers around the world and republished many different times. We had this uh, poor excuse for a video that was released on YouTube by a uh, Coptic Christian uh, from California. And a 14-minute video on YouTube resulted in the deaths of scores of people around the world. Property was destroyed. Muslims' reputation was once again, um, you know, diminished through the actions of a, of a few Muslims around the world. But we should realize, first off, as I begin this topic tonight, that the denigration shown to Rasulullah and the insults against the religion are not something new, meaning it's not only a 21st century phenomenon. If you look back in the Quran and you study, and if you remember Islamic history, you'll know that our beloved Prophet was referred to before the revelation as a sadiq and al-amin. They're trustworthy and they're truthful. Soon as he brought the Quran and began teaching the religion of Islam, those two titles changed. And people referred to him as, for example, asahir, that he was a magician. They say he was majnoon, he was insane. They say he was, um, you know, all of these titles. He was a magician, he was a liar, he was a... Uh, an, an insane individual, and they began to level accusation after accusation against Rasulullah. They brought attacks against the religion, they brought attacks against many aspects of the faith. But we see in the life of the Messenger and in the ways of the, uh, the Ahlul Bayt wassalam, that they gave us an answer for all of these accusations, how to reply to them. And unfortunately what we see in the main discourse out in the world today among so-called Muslims is for perhaps furthest from what the Messenger of Allah would want from us and furthest from what the Ahlul Bayt would expect from us as followers of their noble teachings. And therefore tonight I want to look at the topic of social activism from Nahjul Balagha to see first off, does Amir al-Mu'mineen in one of his sermons, does he talk about how to be socially active in a society? And if so, what does he show us is the way to actually enlighten the masses of the religion of Islam. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> this is a very beautiful verse of the Quran from chapter 3, Surah Ali Imran, verse 186. It's, uh, there's a, a portion that came before it, but I removed that because it wasn't a part of what I wanted to mention tonight. But this is a very interesting verse because Allah foretells us that, and this is a timeless truth, that the problems that we see within the world today against Islam won't be something new, that this is something that Allah foretold 1400 years ago in the Quran. And the verse says, وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذَنْ كَثِيرًا Allah says, you shall certainly hear from those people who have been given the book before you, and those who are the polytheists, he says, Adhan kathiran, much annoying and grievous talk. Wa in tasbiru wa tattaku fa inna dhalika min azmil umur. But Allah says, if you are patient and you guard against evil, you express your taqwa, your piety, and your consciousness of the Almighty Creator, surely this is one of the affairs which should be determined upon. Allah told us 1400 years ago that we would hear much grievous talk against Islam. The mushrikeen of Quraysh 14 centuries ago when they called the Prophet Majnoon or Sahir or all of these derogatory names, this wasn't just 1400 years ago. This was a cycle that they started. But even when you look at prophets of the Quran before Rasulullah came, when Prophet Noah came to his people, People in, in Surah, you look at the chapter of Prophet Nu in the Quran, and we're told that people would put their fingers in their ears, 
and they would take their clothing and cover over their head so that they don't hear the words of Prophet Noah. And this is not only Prophet Noah, but Prophet Moses, Prophet Jesus. You know, all of these great prophets were facing the same sort of attacks by their community members, friends and foes. People were one day relatives and friends. Next day they turn into enemies of these prophets of God. So we should rep appreciate the fact that what we see in the media today, the videos on YouTube, the cartoons in the newspapers, all of this propaganda and negative, negative, negativism against the religion of Islam and the messenger is not something that is new. It is a history which is 14, gener 14 centuries old and even more than that with the previous prophets. You know, when you look on the, in the, in, on the internet and you look at pictures of how Muslims are depicted, especially after these events, you see images like this. Now, I, I looked at this picture and I thought to myself, first of all, there's a picture of President Obama and it says, Obama, go to hell. But I couldn't understand why he was looking like one of the char characters from the movie Avatar. It just, it, I, I, I saw the movie, but I didn't know what relationship Obama has to the movie Avatar. But fine, they have a picture of Obama dressed up like one of the character, you know, characters from that movie. But then you have those young children with a sign that says, Massacre those who insult Islam. Right? And that, for me, was problematic. And I hope for most of us it was problematic, if not for all of us, that teaching children at a young age that violence is the way to settle such disputes, rather than using logic and, and wisdom, as Allah tells us in the Quran, that that was a problem for me, that those children were holding up these signs that, you know, the answer to your problem is just to kill people who have any religious difficulties or issues with the faith or with the Messenger of Allah. And that, to me, wasn't a representation of what the Messenger of Allah and what the Ahlul Bayt would have expected from the believers. Then we had people like the so-called pastor. He's not a pastor, we know that. He's a man who claims Christianity, but he is as far as from, from, from Christianity, I think, as people like Osama bin Laden are from Islam. And as we don't recognize people like that as being spokesmen for our religion, we also don't respect and acknowledge this man to be a representation of Christianity because I'm sure all of us know very good Christians, very good Jews, very good people of other religions who don't have the vile hatred that this man espoused against the religion of Islam and the Prophet. But here is a man who out of his own ignorance, perhaps of the religion, maybe he had uh, a, you know, a vested interest to, to, to profit financially off of what he was doing, but for whatever reason, he was taking the situation at hand and he was trying to really, I think, profit from it and make, him, make himself to be greater than he actually is. And then I found a picture like this of this young woman in probably India or Pakistan and a banner which says, We are ready to die for you, Ya Muhammad. Perhaps it's a beautiful thought, but I thought to myself that you're ready to die for the Prophet, but who's ready to live for the Prophet? Who's ready to actually live and, and, and bring a message of positive change and a positive message about Islam to the people? Sure, it's easy to say that I'm willing to sacrifice myself. And you know, even in the ziyarat of Sayyid al-Shuhada, we say this every time. We even say that, may my father and mother be sacrificed for you, Abba Abdullah. And may my wealth and my property and myself and my children, may everything I have be sacrificed. And that's all well and good on its own. But also we have to ask ourselves, is that who is willing to live and who's willing to work for the message of Ahlul Bayt wassalam, and for the Prophet of Islam. And when you look at it and how I understand it is that this really is an, the solution or the, or the answer to all of this is that many people are in the dark about the religion of Islam. Whether it be that person who claims to be a religious figurehead of his church and the words of attack against the Rasulullah and against the Quran or a lot of those Muslims who go out there and burn flags of various countries, who demonize people of other religions, and who, who really paint an image of the religion which is not there within the Quran and within the teachings that we have from the Messenger and from his holy family. I think all of them are in this darkness of, of ignorance. And, and obviously ignorance is of various levels. You have people who are you know, blindly in love with Rasulullah and their blindness 
detracts them from understanding the true message of the Prophet. And then you have people who are blindly hating against Rasulullah. And their hatred, their blind hatred for the Messenger also leads them to extremism in various other ways. So the question that I, I came to myself was that, well, what would the Ahlul Bayt do? You know, we put them up on a pedestal and we say that we follow the Ahlul Bayt. We want to, you know, wear clothing like them. We want to pray like them. We want to do things that they did. We want to eat how the Ahlul Bayt ate. We want to live our lives following the sunnah of Rasulullah and the, and the tradition of the Ahlul Bayt. When we get married, we try to arrange our weddings to fit in line with how the Ahlul Bayt had their wedding ceremonies. In Muharram, we have our Muharram commemorations, just how the Ahlul Bayt taught us to have the commemorations. So we try to mold our lives around a lot of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. So one of the things also that we have to look at is how do the Ahlul Bayt expect us to reply to people when they attack the religion. Whether, people be, whether those people be from outside of Islam or even people who are within the religion. And you know, when you look at the 12 Imams, you'll realize that really the first Imam was the only one who had the ability and the opportunity to issue or, or, or to look at social issues and come up with solutions for the believers. Because we know Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and, and every Imam after that they were basically in, in such precarious situations because of the event of Karbala or because of what was happening um, at other times with the Bani Umayya and Bani Abbas that they never had the opportunity to really expound upon the religion in, in ways that would be, um, you know, sort of ways that we could relate to today because of their own situation that they're in. I mean, there are teachings that they gave us on various other issues of life, but because Imam Ali alayhi salam had to deal with you know, he lived at the time of the messenger and then he had that, you know, that time span of 20 plus years where he was denied the leadership of the community. And then finally when he becomes the official leader of the community, we know that he had many wars he fought within that four year period until his own martyrdom. But he had the ideal time that we can relate and reflect upon. You know, whether it be the letter he wrote, wrote to Malik Ashtar when he sent him to Egypt as the governor. And when he gave a beautiful statement, and in, in, in that entire document, there's one sentence which always resonates in my head, where he tells Malik, he says, Malik, know that you are going to a country in which different leaders have ruled over the people. Because, you know, Egypt had a very long history. The pharaohs were there. They had a lot of ups and downs in, in, in history of Egypt. And Imam Ali tells Malik, he says that when you go to Egypt, he says, know that the people that you will govern over are of two different kinds. He says, either they are your brothers in faith, they're the Muslims who follow your same religion, or he says they are, as he says in the Arabic, nadirun fil khalq. They are your equals in humanity. So they're Christians, they're Jews, they're whatever other religion. But he tells Malik that you make sure you deal with both groups of individuals with fairness and in the proper way. So we see that Imam Ali had that opportunity to issue political statements to develop economic policy, to develop a foreign, you know, foreign relations policy with different nations at that time. And in sermon number 206, which I want to reflect on tonight, he gives a very, a very interesting statement to his companions. This sermon was delivered just after the Battle of Sifin. And if you know the Battle of Sifin, this is where Imam Ali had gathered the troops to go and fight against Muawiyah. And they finished the battle, and we, I won't go into the history of what happened in that battle and how it ended, but sometime after the battle, they were making their way back to Kufa, where his government was established, where his government was established. And the companions of, the, uh, of Imam were sitting around one evening, and they began talking bad about the people of Sham, about Muawiyah and people who followed Muawiyah. And they began to use foul language, derogatory terms. They, used to use, they were using very vulgar language against the people of Sham. And maybe they were justified in doing it because they had just fought a battle. They should have recognized that Imam Ali was the rightful successor of the messenger and that they had no right to fight him. But for some reason they were you know, launching this campaign against Amir al-Mu'mineen and he went and went to defend the Muslim territory and the Muslim community and obviously the religion of Islam. And on the way back, his companions are, are sitting there in a gathering one night, cursing and using foul language against 
Muawiyah and his people. And look at what Imam Ali says at the first level of this, of this discussion on social activism, how he wanted his followers to address the situation. Step one is to be smart. And keep in mind, this is not only for 1400 years ago, I also want to relate this to the situation of the Muslim community today. So first thing is to be smart of what is happening. He says to his companions, he says that, I dislike you to be of those people who verbally abuse and curse those other people. Meaning Muawiyah and the people who followed the ideology of Muawiyah. So Imam Ali -Islam, didn't even expect his companions who were justified perhaps to insult and, 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 and abuse these people. He still said, you know what, be smart, use your wisdom. Don't just sit around and curse them and, 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 and you know, use foul language. Use another ploy, use another tactic to basically bring the situation to light. So first he says that be smart, he goes don't just abuse them, you know, use another avenue to make the people aware of what the situation is. Level two, Imam Ali says, is speak out against the oppression. He says, however, he goes, if you describe their actions, what they were doing, why, are the, why was Muawiyah so bad? Why were the people of Sham so bad? He says, if you describe their actions and communicate their conditions, meaning their conduct, he goes, that would be a better mode of speaking, and that would be a more convincing way of arguing with the people. So here what we have to appreciate that, yet at one level, it's good to have protests and rallies and marches to let our opinion be known. But if you just go out with a big banner, or you burn a flag, or you have a sign, and you're not telling the people why we're upset about what's happening, then those banners and protests and those flags really mean nothing at the end of the day. They'll just see us as a bunch of Muslims walking down the street, angry, with big signs in our hands, but they really won't know why we're angry. They won't know what, th what the situation is. Because unfortunately the reality is, is that a lot of people out there, Muslims included, but also the non-Muslim community, they don't all follow what happens around the world in the news media. And if they do, they're going to Fox or MSNBC or CNN or any of these outlets which are not providing an alternative uh, interpretation of what is happening out there in the world today. So if you just flip on to one of the major media news stations, you won't see a true picture of what is happening in a lot of countries, including even within our own country of Canada. You know, we mentioned this before, that even when the Occupy movement happened, the 99% occupying, uh, you know, protesting against the 1%, that this was happening for months before the mainstream media picked it up. But if you went to the alternative media outlets and if you went to the internet, you saw that things were happening even locally that people were not talking about. And unfortunately, a lot of the people out there today, they don't look at the alternative media. They take whatever they're given and they basically form the opinion on what they see in mainstream media today, which doesn't provide a fair and balanced understanding of what is happening globally. So Imam Ali says that don't just protest, don't just sit there and, and, and have slogans and banners and, and argue and, and you know, demonstrate, but rather he tells his companions that go out and tell the people, describe the actions and what Muawiyah was doing that really got you to, to that level of having to go and fight against him. And if we look at that in our own society today, it's not only enough to, for example, have a protest to ban YouTube or to boycott YouTube or to ban this magazine or that book or, or to ban this, you know, whatever it is. But we have to go that step further, as Imam Ali says, and actually tell people why we're upset by what's happening. You know, and you see a double standards. You know, when, when it came to the pictures of the Prophet, these caricatures which were drawn, Western governments wouldn't ban those. They said, no, it's freedom of speech. You can't ban those pictures. But yet, you see when it came to even events which happened even just last month in England, where an ice cream company, a company that makes ice cream, they had an ad campaign in London where they had a picture of a nun pregnant and having eating ice cream. And it, the theme was something like this was, the ice cream was an immaculate conception, the flavor that they created. And this ad was actually banned from British media because you're showing a nun that was pregnant. And that goes against, against the Catholic Church. So there they can ban that advertising or they can ban the pictures of 
the, the queen's granddaughter, whoever it was who got married, they had some compromising pictures of her. They can ban those pictures from the media, but yet they can't ban pictures of Rasulullah that people have drawn in a derogatory fashion against the Messenger of Allah, which would insult 1.8 billion people, and the ad for ice cream might insult maybe a few million people. So we see that there is a definite discrimination within the media, but if we don't tell this to the people, then how are they going to know? They'll just see a Muslim with a big sign that says, Boycott YouTube, and they won't know the whole situation, but why we're upset about things happening as they are in the media. So step two is to let people know why we're upset, to give awareness and knowledge of what the situation is and what the issues at hand are. But Imam Ali doesn't end there. He gives us a third step. And he says at level three, he says, and he makes a dua for the community. And it's a beautiful dua that the Imam Ali makes. And it relates to every issue that we see happening in the world today. He says, instead of abusing these people, he says, you should say and make this dua. He says, oh Allah, Allahumma. He says, oh Allah, save our blood and their blood. I mean, don't let the blood shed continue. Don't let innocent people be killed on either side of the equation. O oh Allah, save our blood and their blood. Produce reconciliation between us and between them. Again, we want to see reconciliation. We want to be able to live as a group of human beings, as a civil society. We want everybody to respect other religions. I don't expect just non-Muslims to respect Islam, but I think Muslims also should respect the sensitivities of other religions. We should respect Christianity, Judaism, their symbols, their holidays. If we expect them to do the same to us, we have to also show that same respect for them. So Imam Ali says, save our blood in their blood. Produce reconciliation between us and them. And lead them out of their misguidance so that the one who is ignorant of the truth may know it. And again, this goes back to the crux of the issue. A lot of the things we see happening today, maybe there is an agenda behind the scenes, but I think, honestly, a lot of people don't know about Islam. They're ignorant of the religion because we have not done anything to educate them of Islam. Again, what they know of Islam is what they see on the media. They perhaps have never met Muslims. They've never met level-headed Muslims who follow Islam, who live in North America, who speak English, who aren't of that backward, back-home mentality. But they don't see that. They just see what's on TV. And therefore, they have that ignorance of the religion. And that's why Imam Ali says, lead them out of their misguidedness so that the one who is ignorant of the truth may know what the truth is. And he who inclines towards rebellion and revolt may turn away from it. So it's not just an issue of making dua. You know, Imam Ali didn't say, just make a dua and everything will be okay. Unfortunately, we also have this narrow-minded mentality. We'll just come and pray du'as, we'll do du'as, we'll do a, lot, do a du'a, and everything will be okay. As if a little magic wand will be, you know, tapped, and little fairy dust will be sprinkled on the heads of the people, and the minds will all change. No, it's not that easy. We have to make du'as, right? But we also have to do something. Imam Ali has a beautiful hadith where he says that the sickness is within yourself, but also within you is the cure. Right? So if a person is suffering from lung cancer and he smokes a pack a day, well, his problem is because he smokes. Right? And if we see that Muslims have a bad rap in this era, it's because a lot of us have done nothing to give us a, a good reputation. So we have to ask ourselves, what have we done? Maybe we don't have the ability. Okay, fine. We don't have the knowledge to go and, and, and speak and be on television and produce video clips and put them on the internet. But we can is find people who have that ability, give them the resources, give them the financial backing, give them the tools so they can do that job. They can sit in front of a camera and produce videos, and they can put them on the different uh, you know, in internet sites and actually help and teach those out there a bit about the religion of Islam. But it's not going to be easy, obviously, and I'm not going to stand here and say, yeah, it's you know, a, a, a two-day job and we can do it, because when you look at it, this is what we're facing today. We're facing the social media monopoly. You know, we got Facebook to deal with. We got people tweeting crazy things about Islam. You got people on, on maybe not LinkedIn, because that's more for professionals, and you don't have a lot of that craziness on LinkedIn. But you've got every other media outlet out there on the Internet, and 
well, this is what we have to compete with, right? They've got billions of dollars behind them. You know, YouTube is probably raking in millions, if not billions, in ad revenue. So for them to keep that 14-minute video online, and, you know, incidentally, I watched that video. It was very difficult for me to watch it, but I watched it maybe a month ago. And when I watched it, it was a Friday night, and there was about 1.2 or 1.4 million hits on that video. I went to that same video two days later, 48 hours later, it was up to 3.5 million. So in 48 hours, 2 million people more watched that video. And that doesn't include all the other repeats on, on all the other media sites out there that were putting that video and posting that video under different names. So hundreds of millions of people are watching that video, a 14 minute video clip. So we have a lot to go up against. We have a lot of work to do. You know, we have a lot of things to, to do to get that image out there when 10, 20, 30 million people can watch a video and within a week it goes viral. Well, then we have a lot to do because we have to produce something which will be something that will go viral as quickly and which will catch the attention of the people. And it's difficult in this day and age. You know, it's difficult from many different perspectives, but it's not impossible. It's something that can be done, but it takes a group of, be of believers. It takes obviously a budget. It takes a lot of manpower, a lot of ingenuity. It takes a lot of things to do to get to that level. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So what can we do? You know, if you look at the way that the world of marketing is, I don't know if anybody in our community is in marketing. I know back home, in my other home in Kitchener, we have a lot of people who are in marketing who are, who are doing it full-time in, in college and university. But we have to look at Islam as how do we market the religion of Islam? That take Islam as a commodity. And what do you do to market the religion to the masses out there? Come up with a strategy, a blueprint, a plan for how do you present the religion. And don't, you know, we don't want to talk about sugarcoating the religion and, and making it look fluffier and, you know, very cute and, 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 and pretty like that. But no, how do we present the basics, the teachings of the religion, and how do we market it to people? Just like you see corporate, you know, the corporate world marketing their products. That this thing does this, and, it, and it, you know, the battery life is like this, and the screen is this big, and it does all of this for you, and it'll make you happy, and you'll download a million apps for it. How do we market the religion of Islam? I don't claim to have the answer tonight, but I'm sure somebody in this room, I'm sure Muslims, if we get together and we think about it, how do we actually sit down and, and look at Islam as a religion, as a holistic way of life, not just the religion of praying and fasting, but you look at the economic policy, the social system that Islam brought in, everything that Islam brought, how do you take all of that and how do you market this religion to the masses? What are the outstanding features of Islam that would, want, that would make a person convert to Islam? Or, or even if not convert, at least accept and appreciate the Muslims as human beings. Right? It's not all about converting people. It's great for them to come to Islam. It's great for them to earn salvation. But we want to also not only look at the numbers, but at least get the message out to the people. So we have to look at how do we market this religion? How do we present it in a way as the Ahlul Bayt would have brought it, as the Prophet brought it to the people? And we have to find a strategy that will work in this day and age. You know, sometimes people who I'm sure mean very well, they come to Canada from another country and they've been here for a few years and they decide, okay, you know what, we're going to have a protest or we're going to have a march or we're going to have some sort of, a, you know, some event. And they use methodologies that back home may have worked perfectly well. But they don't realize that back home they're dealing with a population where 99% of the population were, were Muslims. They didn't deal with people of other religions. They didn't deal, deal with people with a particular mentality. And to give you one example, when I had gone overseas to Scandinavia some years back for Muharram, one of the brothers, they, they were having their annual Ashura Day procession in the downtown of the city. And so they obviously wanted to have the procession with the banners. And this brother was from that country, born there from, but originally from East Africa. So he was part of the organizing committee. And one of the suggestions, because there's people from different ethnic backgrounds, they said, well, we want to have a banner that says, Ya Aba Abdullah in Arabic. And this brother said, well, we have to have one in Urdu. And he said, we want to have one in Farsi. And this brother says, well, we don't speak either of these languages in this country. Why don't we have it in the native language of the people? 
And first of all, that was like sacrilegious because, you know, it, it has to be in Arabic and it has to be black with blood stains on it and it has to look in a specific way and you have to carry your coffin down the main street or else people won't know this is an Ashura. And he tried to get into their head, well, yes, this is Ashura, but that's not how you want to represent Ashura to people when they see a coffin being prayed down the street, they're not going to know what to think. And then he was telling me, he says, the second thing they wanted to do was to serve refreshments to the passerbys, passersby, and give them some literature about Islam, about Karbala, what happened. And you know, traditionally we give out water. They give out sharbat or water as a drink on the, on the day of Ashura. But this was Muharram in, in Scandinavia, and it's minus 25 outside in the daytime. And he tells them, he says, you can't give bottles of cold water to people when it's minus 25 outside. So his suggestion was that this country that we live in, you know, they love coffee and they love gingerbread cookies. So put up a table with gingerbread cookies and a cap of cappuccino and keep a flyer about Imam Hussein there. And again, he was reprimanded. He goes, this is, you know, this is an insult to Imam Hussein. He wanted water. He said, yeah, he wanted water, but this is minus 20. You don't give people cold water on a cold day. So for him to really change the mindset, he had to come up with a strategy that would work for his country that he lived in. You know, if he was back in Africa or India or Pakistan or some warm country or South America, then he could give out bottles of water or he could give something else that people would, you know, benefit from and enjoy. But he was living in a country which the weather and the climate was not conducive to that sort of a form of tabligh. So my point being is that when we come up with a strategy, we need to look at the environment that we live in. If we have a procession in downtown on Ashura Day, and it's minus 35 outside, we don't expect people to take bottles of water. Maybe we probably don't even expect them you know, to even walk in and stop because it'll be so cold. So we need to look at how we present Ashura or this you know, attacks against the prophet or against the religion in a way that will make sense to the community that we're living within. And when we do that, then we can perhaps make a change within the society. So three things that I've just wanted to mention very briefly on what we can perhaps do. There's obviously much more, but these are just things that come to mind. One is to produce writing or translate a comprehensive biography of the Prophet of Islam. You know, it's, 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 it's a shame for me to stand here and say that from the Shia point of view, from our Shia ideology, we only have one biography of the Messenger of Allah in English. One biography that I would feel comfortable giving to a non-Muslim. But even then I can't give it to him or her because it, it is written in, in, and has, uh, it's translated in a way that only a Muslim would understand a lot of the terminology. So in actuality, we don't even have a proper look at the life of the Prophet in English that I could give out to a non-believer. That is a problem because here we say that they don't respect the Prophet, but how do they respect a man they don't know? We don't have movies on the Prophet. Yeah, we have a cartoon on the Messenger's life. We have a movie that Hollywood made 30 years ago called The Message starring Anthony Quinn about the Prophet. But imagine in the last 40 years, nobody has made a movie on the life of the Prophet in English. It's a shame, really, that we spend millions and millions and billions on building centers and eating food. And, and you know, we drive beautiful cars. We buy our BMs and our Lexus and our Jaguars and our Mercedes. And you go to some communities in, in North America and you count the cars in the, in the parking lot and they're probably worth excess of five or ten million. But yet we don't have money to put a book together on the life of the prophet. We don't have money to produce a documentary on the life of the messenger. So we can look at that as an example that what we can we do to contribute to the life of the prophet is put something together or hire somebody to write or translate something which would be conducive to a Western mi mindset and that they could read and appreciate the life of the Prophet of Allah. This could be given to public libraries, to interfaith groups, to study circles. Many different things can be done once the literature is available to give to the audience. Another thing, as we mentioned, are to produce video clips on the life of the Prophet. You know, we have some literature out there um, uh, looking at the life of the Messenger. We just pr you know, produce short three or four or five minute video clips on the life of the Prophet and put them up onto the various video uh, streaming sites on the internet. That in itself also, and, and if we do the right strategy to get the word out and people can you know, find the video easily, then again there's an avenue where people can see 
and hear about the life of the Prophet. And again, even if they don't convert, that's not the outcome, that's not the goal that we should have. We should be looking for them to at least appreciate the religion. And finally, as another thought, is to produce even short brochures and pamphlets on the Messenger of Islam. It doesn't have to be a large book, but just something to give an awareness to the community about whom Rasulullah was. Finally, this picture was actually uh, an event that took place in Birmingham in the United Kingdom last, I, th I think about a week or two ago. And many of the universities actually across North America had this day um, that you maybe you may have heard about, that the, an, a day to give roses out in the name of the Prophet. So basically the, what the aim was in this event in Birmingham is that the Muslim community got together, they purchased 1,000 roses, and they had a little card design, like a postcard size, um, with a verse of the Quran about the Prophet, and on the other side was a brief three-paragraph, a uh, very brief summary of who the Prophet was. And they went downtown into the downtown city of Birmingham, and they handed out roses to men and women who walked by and explained to them who they were, you know, that they were Muslims, and this was their aim, to spread awareness of the Messenger of Allah. And the website which had the video, they interviewed a lot of non-Muslims, and, you know, what their reaction was. And everybody had a positive reaction to getting this rose and to hearing about the life of the Prophet. Just, this, just yesterday, even in University of Waterloo, in Ontario, the, the university students, the, the, uh, the group who are known as the um, Thakalain Muslim Students Association, they also held the same event just yesterday in, in Waterloo. And U of T and, and, and Dearborn, Michigan and New York, a lot of other communities have done the same thing. So this is one positive thing, you know, rather than having banners, death to Obama and death to America and death to Canada and death to this and that, death to that, which serves no purpose. And I mean, if death to Canada, well, we all live in Canada. What's going to happen to us, right? Why not do a positive change and, and, and a positive act and give people the message of Rasulullah? Show what he was because the Quran calls him Rahmatul Lil Alameen. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you except as a rahmah, as a mercy to the entire universe. He wasn't sent as a punishment or as a curse. He was a mercy to the humanity. So if we can portray and project the mercy that the Prophet manifests from himself, and we can show the people out there who the messenger was in a positive way, not through banners and protests and, and slogans against this and that and demonize individuals, then I think we would make, have a much better opportunity to actually get them to hear the message. And even, again, and I'll end with this, is one of the verses of the Quran where Allah says, فَبَشِّرْ ibad, الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَ Allah says, so give glad tidings to my servants. Those who hear the various opinions, the various you know, statements and, and, and words that are floating around, and they follow the best of what they hear. I think if we follow that verse of the Quran and we present the best side of Islam to the masses, then we have an opportunity, as the eighth Imam says, that had the people heard the beauty of our words, Imam Radha says, he said that they would have no choice but to follow us, the Ahlul Bayt. I end and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed night of Eid, the day that we are returning back to our primordial nature as servants of Allah, that He gives us all the tawfiq, the divine providence, to be able to follow the message of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah to give us all the ability to be able to instill the love of Rasulullah within our hearts and within the hearts of our family members. And that we can continue to share that love of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt to all of those out there today who are searching and who are looking for answers within their life. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta asmeel alim. Let's end with reciting one more salawat and one surah fatiha for the thawab of all of the marhumin who had been mentioned and all of those who have been forgotten and who are long departed. Suratul Mubarakatul Fatiha preceded by one salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, please.